Why did you stay at Southampton your whole career? Why were you so loyal? Um, well, I, I, I love the area for a start. Uh, I love the fans. They were brilliant to me in my early days. They were amazing. The support I got from them was incredible. You know, given that I wasn't great every game. You know, I, I, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't the most consistent uh, performer in my early years. Um, but they were always incredibly supportive of me. Um, they loved what I did, what I was trying to do. Um, they loved the fact I was a bit different. Um, uh, and so they, they were a big reason why I, why I didn't go. I, and I always felt like I owed Southampton something. Um, you know, I was just a little kid from Guernsey who dreamed of becoming a professional footballer. Uh, and Southampton were the ones that gave me my opportunity to do that. You know, I wanted to play for England uh, and I managed to do that whilst I was playing for Southampton. So uh, I, was, I was eternally grateful for, for the chance that Southampton gave me to, to fulfil my dreams as a kid. And why aren't modern players of that attitude, why aren't they as loyal anymore? Or, um, or are they, or am I wrong about that? No, I think that there might be the, the occasional one. Um, not many though, are there? No, there, there's not many. And there, to be honest, there wasn't that many in my day. Right. Um, I don't know. I see the the one thing that, that was labelled at me through my career was, was oh, you stayed at Southampton, you had a lack of ambition. So as a kid, when people talk about lack of ambition, as a kid growing up in Guernsey, I had an ambition to be a professional footballer, which not many Guernsey men had ever been a professional footballer. And I wanted to play for England. No Guernsey men had ever played for England. So... That's quite lofty ambitions for, mm. for a little kid in Guernsey. <laughs> so when people go, oh, you had no ambition. I go, well, actually, think about it. I had quite a big ambition, actually, for, for... I wanted to be the first Guernsey man ever to play for England. And I did that. Mm. So um, uh, it's just... Yeah, that's one of those things that you have, to, you have to put up with as a professional footballer is that people like to criticise. Mm. And you just deal with that. That's probably actually stood me in really good stead for the last two years because... <laughs> <laughs> that, those years of spending a lot of time being criticised by the media, um, it actually just bounces off and I don't really give a shit about the media, to be honest. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people that don't have that kind of Teflon. I know. And what would you say to someone who does get easily upset by what other people think? Um... It's difficult because not, I know that not everybody's the same. You know, not everybody has, has my mentality. And, it's, and not, every, not everybody is able to take on that mentality because we're all made up differently. Mm. Um, so it would be easy for me to, to just go, well, just ignore them. <laughs> because not, it's, not, it's not as easy as that. No. Um, so it's, it's not something that you can kind of you can give advice on. It's just the way that I am. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to think that I could encourage more people to be a bit braver um, by speaking out for what they believe in. And I think at the end of the day, if, if you know something's wrong, um, then you should be confident enough to be able to come out and say that in public. Um, if you feel like that's going to get you in trouble or you feel like you're going to lose your job because of it, then you have to take the broader view and think, oh, hang on, is that the kind of world that I want to live in? You know, and I don't want to live in that world, so that's why I've chosen mm. to, to speak out. So I would encourage other people. And the whole thing about, I don't want to speak out because I might lose my job. Well, actually, I've found that my life has improved because I lost my job. So there is, there is another way, and yeah. it's not all bad on the other side. Which is very inspiring to say to people, because I guess a lot of people probably are in a bit of a prison in yeah. their mind. No, very much so, very much so. And, and sometimes it's, it's good to go out of your comfort zone. You know, I was in, very much in a, in a comfort zone. You know, I had a steady job, sat on the television once a week, sometimes twice if I had a busy week. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And then I was you know, playing, playing lots of golf and I had a good life. Yeah. Um, but I have to say, I, I'm, I'm far happier in my life now mm. than what I was two years ago. And I think that's the thing um, as well, is that 
uh, I think I, had a, I get a lot of I had a lot of text messages, especially after the the whole Ukraine tweet thing uh, and and the abuse that I was getting in the media, and I had a lot of. Um, messages from people on my phone going, just checking in with you, making sure you're okay. And I was like, what are you on about? <laughs> Absolutely fine, what's the matter with you? <laughs> I've never been happier. Uh, as the, 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 the horrible bit about it all is that it kind of sometimes it affects the people around you more than it affects me. So because I don't give a shit, I say stuff and, and I don't care um, because it's what I believe in. Yeah. Uh, and you get criticism and uh, the worst bit is when other people go to other members of your, of your family and go, oh, what about, what about your dad? What's your dad said? And blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and you go, oh. and I say, what are you doing that to my family for? Leave my family alone. Come and speak to me if you've got a problem. Do you know what I mean? If you've got a problem, I'll talk to you about it. I'll, I'll talk to anyone. And, yeah. and this is the, the thing. I've, I've been quite vocal about stuff, but I'm not, I'm not arrogant enough to think that everything I say is is true mm. it's what i believe is happening at the moment but if somebody could point me to some evidence that i'm wrong and I'll, i will actually look at that evidence and if i look at it and go oh blimey actually i've been wrong i've been wrong about that i'll be the first person to put my hand up and go shit i'm really sorry i was wrong mm. i don't see that in a lot of other people mm. and uh, people kind of get entrenched in their positions and go right. This is this is it. This is this is the narrative. This is what I'm sticking to. And no matter how much evidence you show me, I ain't changing my mind. Mm. Uh, and that's a really bad position for you to be in mm. in your life. I think you have to have a really open mind about shit. And uh, and that's what I've got. If somebody if somebody came up with with some evidence and went, well, this is this is what's happening. Really, look, I'll be. All oh, right. Okay. Mm. Fair enough. And uh, and you'll see me on Getter going, I was wrong. Yeah. Well, what's jumping out to me here, and the reason I'm sort of driving at this is because um, I have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen, and they want to start their business. They want to put their product out to the world. They want to sell more stuff. Um, and of course, we're in this culture where there's a lot more awareness of mental health. So I just really like it when people can model things that have worked for other successful people. Um, and what's, what I'm picking up here is, it's okay. It's okay to be wrong. It's mm -hmm. okay to have your opin opinion in vo voice it. It's okay um, it's for okay. someone to be offended as long as, you know, they're not using it in a nefarious way. So what I'm just picking up is, it's okay. Absolutely, it's okay. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to have an opinion. Uh, and it's okay to have a wrong opinion. So what? Yeah. Get on with it. That's how we do it. That's how we move forward in life. Is you don't talk if you don't talk about stuff. How do you improve things? Yeah. If you don't if you don't see a counter argument. How do you improve on what mm. what we've done so far? How do we get this far as human beings if we didn't talk to each other and have different opinions? Yeah. We didn't get to this position by just having one opinion on everything. Uh. That's not how the world works. And you know. Uh, I think that I think if I if I had any message, it would, it would be shit happens. Just get on with it. I love it. You know we should I mean? have that the title. <laughs> <laughs> shit happens. Just get on with it. Yeah. What makes a great pundit? For me, watching watching football, um, I think a great pundit is somebody who would give a little bit of insight into the game that perhaps somebody who wasn't in the game wouldn't know. So I think, I think the best pundits pick up on, on little nuances that perhaps most people wouldn't have recognised. And who out of all the pundits you've worked with or you see currently who you think is really good? Uh, I, think, I think Gary uh, Neville has done a very good job. Uh, I think he's, um, I think he delves very deeply and does his research very well uh, on the teams that he's working on. Um, so I like what Gary does. Uh, he, he sometimes, so even as a professional footballer, I'll listen to Gary and I'll go, oh, I hadn't noticed that. Because quite frankly, when it came to tactics in football, I didn't really give a shit. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> the theme? Yeah. So, <laughs> although I was in a formation, I was put in a formation, I didn't really take a lot of notice of it and I tended to kind of just do my own thing <laughs> on the pitch. Um, and so, 
I didn't really take a huge amount of notice of, of tactics and formations during my career, <laughs> which, uh, which amazingly I then did 15 years as a pundit telling people about formations <laughs> and tactics. But I learned as I went along. Mm. Um, but, I t- but I didn't, I mean, in my job, it wasn't really, it wasn't really so much about the, the nuances. It, it, my job was very different to what Gary does. Yeah. Um, you know, on Soccer Saturday, we were just reporting on the game. We were just trying to paint a picture of what we were watching to the, to the viewers. Mm. Um, and so that's what I, I tried to do. And I tried to do that from a football fan's perspective because I was, I was a football fan. Once I finished being a footballer, OK, I'm an ex-footballer, but I'm now a football fan. Mm. And I try and relay my experiences of being a football fan and trying to you know, tell people what was happening without them actually seeing the pictures. So, mm. um, so yeah, I think pundits for me have different role in different roles. So a soccer Saturday pundit is different to a, a, a Gary Neville Monday night football pundit who is also very different again to doing a co-commentary role. So Gary merges the two roles, mm. um, but they're very different. Um, uh, and I actually tried, I did a few co-commentaries Oh, blimey, 12, 13 years ago, I think it was. Um, and it's a very, very different job to what I was doing on Soccer Saturday, and I don't think I was very good at it. That's why it didn't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I reckon. Anyway. <laughs> they, told me, they told me that they wanted me primarily for Soccer Saturday, uh, and they didn't want to mix the two roles. Basically, that was a polite way of going, you're shit at co-commentary. <laughs> <laughs> there seems to be a theme of Sky not revealing the full truth. Funny <laughs> <laughs> that. So if you enjoyed this, make sure you like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you'd like to watch the full Matt Letissier unfiltered interview, watch it here.